I learned the since, 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 then argument. It's a great argument set up because you're presenting evidence for your arguments. Totally legitimate, especially in the Bible. Since all men, elect and non-elect, are sinners. And since Calvary provided for all sinners, that is to say Jesus Christ on, his, on the cross, propitiation for our sins, then Christ died for all men. See? Point one, point two, conclusion. Christ died for all men. Unlimited atonement. Point one there, we're going to go back and dissect it even further. There is no distinction in Scripture between elect and non-elect sinners in their unregenerate state. There is no distinction. Elect and non-elect in Scripture, sinners in their unregenerate state, all men are totally depraved and incapable of providing anything toward their own salvation. Now, I know what you're going to say. Oh, well, then they can't believe. Yes, they can. You're not contributing anything. You're believing in God's total contribute, contribution for you. You're saying, okay, I'll take it all. God says, I provided it all. And you say, okay, God, I believe your son died for my sins. I'll take it all. Wow. And God graciously provides eternal life for you, out of his love for you. Romans 3, 19, 23. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Kenneth Wiest's remarkable statement, have sinned. He likes to break things down in verbs. You have to get to know your verbs. Have sinned is constitute or arrest. Arrest is punctuated, completed actions, but it's constant in this case. Sin there, sin there, sin there, sin there. All completed actions. All the time. 1 John 1 8, 1 John 1 10. 1 John 1 8. If we say that we have no sin, that's believers say we have no sin. We're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. At any time in our temporal lives, people object to that. Well, that's what it says. If we say that we have not sinned, a period of time I've had people tell me, oh, I've gone a month without sinning. We make him a guide to be a liar, and his liar is what is not in us. So that's supported wherever we go in Scripture. So even the good that all men do is human good, contaminated with whatever motivations come out of every man's sin nature and is therefore unacceptable to God. Isaiah 64, 6. That's where we get it from. In the New Testament, Isaiah 64, 6 is quoted from the Old. We continues the root word, which is translated as sinned, the Greek word hamartano, to miss the mark, thus to fail in obeying the law, the epitome of rules of behavior. Come short is present tense, indicating a constant condition. Come, present tense, right? Constantly a condition uh, in the present of sinful behavior. Right now, come short. The verb is hustero, to be left behind in the race and so fail to reach the goal, to fall short of the end or to lack. So we're out of luck if we're relying on anything we can contribute proactively. You don't contribute to faith. You ask God to do all the contribution for you, which has already been done. Old Testament times, we look forward to Christ on the cross. We look back and say, wow, what a marvelous thing God has provided through his son. Ecclesiastes 7.20 supports this. Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. In Jeremiah 17.9, the heart of man, his mind is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Your mind is sick. We have sick minds when we do the things we do. We, we're, even Christians, we're recognizing, especially if we study the Bible, what is righteous, and we do the unrighteous thing. Poor old Paul in Romans chapter 7. Have you read that? It's a lost case, except for... It's, Look at Romans chapter 7 at the end. You have to read it to the end. You can't stop before because Paul is in misery. Romans chapter 7. At the very end. See? But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, he sins. I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Paul is saying this about himself as a believer. I find that the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good, you're not a... He's not, uh, uh, before he became a believer, he didn't want to do any good. Now he's become a believer, he wants to do good. But the principle is evil is present in Paul. He's, he's torturing, he's tortured by this. But I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. 
So in his inner man, the Holy Spirit dwelling in him, uh, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war, uh, war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Conflict, unbelievable. Day after day, wretched man that I am, he says. He's not saying it to be humorous. Who will set me free from the body of this death? What's the answer? Don't forget to read the last verse. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He spent six chapters explaining justification by faith. You got justified by faith. You have that, that uh, status, that position in Christ. You are righteous by virtue of God's declaration of you, and you will become righteous in your experience. So then Paul says, so then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. But on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. That's us. That's us. So, Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, my, in sin my mother conceived me. In the womb, you're conceived in sin. Isaiah 64, 6. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Confess your sins. By the way, what's in the middle of those two verses? In 1 John 1, 8 and 10. Do this all the time. Remember, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. It's hopeless. No, it isn't. Look at the verse in between. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous. Why? Because his son died for our sins. To forgive us our sins that we confess, and all the more to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the, white, the slate is white clean, moment to moment, day by day. These are believers, and you move on in the Christian life. And you get credited by allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you by studying the Word of God so you have something in your mind the Holy Spirit can teach and lead you with. And you, you can lead a righteous life by grace, by declaration, when you confess it and move on. You recognize that you wasn't, it wasn't perfect, and you move on in the Christian life. Move on to move more and more mature doctrines of the faith. So, point two. Since Christ came into the world to save the lost, the unregenerate, in other words, the, un, the sinners, okay, so, the unregenerate are comprised of elect and unelect, because we don't get born saved, you don't even get conceived saved, right? Luke 5.32, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. What was lost? Every man, woman, and child of accountable age, and even unaccountable age, are lost. But if you die without becoming accountable, before you become accountable, you haven't had a chance to reject the, the gospel. And on that basis alone, you're in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you're not erased from the Book of Life, so you're in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you'll be saved. But when you become accountable, now you're accountable to believe. You continually reject the moment of faith alone in Christ alone, wipes that slate clean, and you have eternal life. 1 Timothy 1.15a, 1.15a, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance, meaning believe, right? Full. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Do you believe that? You know, apply it to yourself. You're a sinner. And if you understand what that means, he came into the world to do what? Be a satisfactory propitiation for your sins. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. John the Baptist declared him. See, we have an understanding. Christ Jesus, the anointed one Christ, Jesus is his human name, died on the cross for your sins. It implies that you might accept it, and then full acceptance, right? It says full acceptance. It's another expression for believing. You believe he came into the world to save you, and you're a sinner. You have eternal life. Point three, then he died to save all mankind, for all men are sinners, elect and not elect. I keep repeating that point because people say, well, no, I'm elect, so I, I have a little, uh, I, I walk two foot off the ground. I'm going to be saved. Well, 
it's true that you'll choose, you'll, you will be, be uh, believing to save of your own volition. And God will draw you. But at that point now, you're accountable. It's not going to happen. But you're under condemnation. It's not going to happen in the future. Grace of God, thank God for the grace of God that you choose to believe. You look back, Lewis Perry Chaper said, when you get to heaven, you look through the archways of heaven. It says, saved by grace through faith. Amen. That's what I did. You look back, and it says, appointed, chosen before the foundation of the world to believe. Wow. God's sovereign has been with you the whole time since before the foundation of the world. So, point F, the doctrine of universal propitiation does not contradict the doctrine of forgiveness of sin. That's the issue. Not whether your sins are paid for. Every man's sin are paid for. Even they were promised to be paid for from Adam and Eve on. Compare 1 John 2.2. 2. And he, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation, means satisfaction, satisfactory payment for our all believers' sins. Okay, okay. Don't stop there. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. That's what all believers elect and not elect. So, well, people don't want to accept this 1 John 2, 2. They go, for Christ is the propitiation for our, our sins and not for ours only, but for the no, sins for those of the whole world of the elect. Well, that's nonsensical because if the elect were the whole world, then why say the whole world? Just trying to twist and turn. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. And you've, and you've added words. So Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our all believers' sins, 1 John 2, 1, and not for ours only. I mean, this sounds obviously, but for others, but also for those of the whole world, that's implied. That includes all unbelievers, elect and non-elect. And the whole world is born and grows up before accountable age as unre uh, unregenerate, unbelievers, elect and non-elect. The option is, do you believe? Elect will inevitably choose to believe. Non-elect will inevitably reject it. So you compare that, 1 John 2, 2, with Acts 10, 43. Here's where forgiveness comes in. Of him, Jesus Christ, all the prophets bear witness, that's Old Testament and New, that through his name, everyone who believes in him has received forgiveness of sins. You believe, you got forgiveness. You don't believe to get your sins paid for. They're already done before you even were born, before you were conceived, before the foundation of the world that was promised. Everyone who believes in him, in Jesus Christ, has received forgiveness of sins. That phrase, everyone who trusts alone in Christ alone, to pay the penalty for one's sins, Acts 10, 39 to 42. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith and had salvation. Not of yourselves, gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. They, they, that happens, then if you believe, you receive the gift of eternal life. 1 John 2, 2, examined earlier, which states that the sins of the whole world passed present and future, are paid for. Does not contradict Acts 10.43, which requires an act of faith from an individual in Jesus Christ as Savior in order to receive forgiveness of sins. This is because there is a marked distinction between having one's sins, one's acts of sin paid for and receiving forgiveness of one's sins. That's the issue. I did a whole study on forgiveness of sins. The assumption is we already have our, our, our transgressions and sins paid for. The penalty is paid for by Jesus Christ. You're not going to pay for the penalty of your sins. You're going to be paid because you're not going to be changed into a perfect human being that's perfectly righteous. You're going to stay your same old self if you haven't trusted in Christ alone. The righteousness has never been any credit to your account, nor will it ever be delivered to your present eternal experience. You'll be unrighteous for the rest of eternity. Living with yourself. Wow. Although the penalty for an individual sin has been paid for whether one believes it or not, thus satisfying God relative to that matter, 
God's forgiveness of that individual is only received when one trusts alone in Christ alone resolve one sin problem. 